We've got a lot of big news for Linux users this week. We've got everything from market share growth to the latest updates for your favorite Linux distributions. Desktop Linux hits 4% market share. That's the highest it's ever been, by the way. Linux from scratch just released a new version for their those who are looking for building their own OS. Also, Fedora is considering dropping Xorg entirely on Fedora 41 Workstation. Arch Linux users are getting a pretty big update to their package manager Pac-Man. Plus, we are so close to 30,000 subscribers on this YouTube channel. If you enjoy the show and you aren't subscribed to the channel, maybe you're listening to the Potty Podcast audio-only version. If you just go to the YouTube channel, click that subscribe button. I'd appreciate it because we're so close, less than 50 people away. That would be awesome if you could help me reach that milestone. So there you go. Please do that. Thisweekinlinux.com slash YouTube. Now, let's jump into this week's episode of This Week in Linux, your source for Linux. Good news. This episode of Twill is sponsored by Collide. More on them later. Just a quick announcement. I'll be packing my bags and heading to the Southern California Linux Expo, which is called Scale, next week. That's right. We'll be live on scene from sunny Pasadena, California. By we, I mean Ryan, Jill, and myself from Destination Linux. We're gonna, she's, they're going to be joining me at scale. It's going to be a lot of fun. We have a lot of stuff planned, so buckle up. Here's a, few, a quick list of what we're going to be doing. We've got our own booth in the Expo Hall. We have booth number 420. Yeah, really. I didn't pick it. 420. <laughs> it's just, that's what they gave us. So there you go. And we have a lot of cool stuff that's going to be at the booth. You can get some cool Tux Digital related stickers and other stuff. We're also going to be doing a giveaway there, which is going to be cool because we're giving away a Raspberry Pi 5 kit. So you get the Pi, you get a keyboard, a mouse, and some other stuff. Really cool. And it's just, you just go up there, uh, let us know you want to be in the raffle, and that's it. And we give you a ticket, and there you go. Also, we'll be conducting interviews with some of the brightest minds in open source. So... Get ready for insightful discussions and maybe a laugh or two, because let's face it, dad jokes will be all over the place. Also, we're going to be mingling with the community because we love meeting our viewers and fellow open source enthusiasts. So come say hi, share your projects, or swap some war stories. We've all battled a stubborn configuration file or two. Also going to be live streaming while we're there, live on the Destination Linux channel. So you can catch a lot of the action live on stream with some behind the scenes shenanigans and all sorts of stuff. We may or may not do a vlog. That that took a lot of effort the last time I did a vlog, so we might not do that, but you know, who knows? It might pop, it might happen. It might. But for those who are worried about maybe there won't be an episode of Twill next week, you will still be able to get your this week in Linux fix. Even if you can't make it to scale, I'll be pre-recording next week's episode of the show before I leave so you won't have to miss anything. Also, huge shout out to Linbit for sponsoring our trip to scale. Their continued support is what makes these kinds of adventures like this possible. But seriously, Linbit, you're the kernel to our operating system. Okay, maybe that metaphor needs some work, but you get the idea. If you're at scale, be sure to swing by booth 420 and say hello. We can't wait to meet you and celebrate all things open source. I'll see you there. We have some awesome news related to the market share of Linux because Linux is waddling out of the shadows. StatCounter reports desktop Linux usage has broken the 4% barrier. This is the highest ever. And here's the kicker. This doesn't even count Chrome OS. If you add that in, we're about 10%. But should we add it in is really the question. But anyway, this is some good news. Desktop Linux usage is steadily increasing, reaching over 4% in February 2024, compared to the 1.5% that it had for most of the 21st century. But this is awesome because there's more people using computers and desktop these days, more and more, so the percentage of actually going up is even more people than you would imagine. So 4% doesn't seem like a lot, but it is a massive amount of people, millions and millions of people. So this is awesome. Now, of course, Windows still has the majority, and they're going to keep that for a little while, but we are making some good strides, and also Microsoft doesn't seem to care all that much about Windows these days, so that's good for us too. And Linux is getting better and better every year, and it just proves it that people, more people are wanting to use it, and we get the market share up. And I actually predicted on Destination Linux in our prediction episode for this year that we were going to hit 4%. I actually said it on Steam because I thought it'd be easier to do that on Steam rather than the entirety of, of Linux. And now, well, 
I'm right. I like that. I, I like that. Also, let's go back to the Chrome OS topic. So technically, Chrome OS uses the Linux kernel and can run some Linux apps. So it sort of blurs the line between a Linux distro and not a Linux distro. So do we count it? And personally, I do not. We don't need to count it because we still get the 4% without Chrome OS. If we had Chrome OS in the counting, that's 10%. So that's even better. But Chrome OS has a little bit of an issue in that it's based on Linux, but it modifies a lot and it does a lot of things differently and also weirdly, similar to Android. Because if we counted Android, then Linux owns the entire mobile market. And if we counted Chrome OS, it still doesn't own the desktop market, but it's a pretty high percentage at that point, And it's right there next to uh, Mac at, at that point too. But I'm okay with not counting Chrome OS because it's not technically a Linux distribution, even though it is based on Linux. So I'm happy to say that we don't even need Chrome OS. We still got 4% of the market share. Now, okay, Chrome OS has 6%, but that's not... That doesn't matter. That doesn't count. <laughs> anyway, so the Linux growth suggests potential for a larger user base coming even now, especially with this uh, rumor that Windows might become a subscription based system, which would be fantastic for us and ridiculous for them. But if you'd like to learn more about this, you'll find links in the show notes. Remember that time as a kid when you spent months meticulously building a Lego masterpiece only to have your little cousin come in and just smash it to bits? Well, that's kind of what just happened with the world of Nintendo Switch emulation. After a lawsuit from Nintendo, the creators of Yuzu, a popular Switch emulator, have thrown in the towel, agreeing to shut down the project and pay a hefty fine. But fear not, emulation fans, there may be a glimmer of hope still. Let's, let's talk about Yuzu. So we, we actually mentioned Yuzu way back in the day on episode 209 of Twill in August of 2022. And Yuzu is an emulator for running Nintendo Switch games. Now, the lawsuit that Nintendo didn't actually win because it was settled out of court, so that's not technically any like setting precedent or anything, but the Yuzu, Yuzu emulator officially shutting down after this legal battle with Nintendo is a really bu it's a big bummer. But there are also some people commenting like it, it may make sense. We'll get to that in a bit. So this is a also they have to pay a huge fine of two point four million dollars for the settlement, which I don't think really matters to Nintendo at all. That's basically pocket change for them. But even that, maybe not even pocket change, maybe less than that, because that's a massive company. Right. But it's a big deal for anybody who's making emulators because it might scare them. And I think that's really the goal for Nintendo here anyway. So Yuzu t team agrees to cease operations, but also pay $2.4 million in damages in the settlement. So Nintendo claims that Yuzu also facilitated game links and piracy and it was hurting their sales. That's why the um, this settlement had an, a, an a paint damages thing in it, because they're saying that Yuzu helped facilitate these kinds of things. And I'm not saying whether they did or not, but there are reports that says that there are some things that weird things kind of happen. But we'll get to that in a second. So the Yuzu team is dismantling the Yuzu websites, code, social media, all that sort of stuff, shutting it down permanently. And this also hurts not just the emulator for Yuzu, but it also hurts the Citra emulator that they also made, which is the 3DS emulator. So that's a bummer too. So the 3DS and the Nintendo Switch are going down. So it's not surprising. Not at all, because Nintendo is, how, what's the word? Uh, meticulously insane about lawsuits against anyone they can. Even YouTubers get tons of hits and hate related to uh, you doing anything related to Nintendo. Now, I mean, it's from Nintendo. And that's just my opinion because they've had so many takedown stuff because people played a game and recorded it, you know? Anyway, that's just my opinion. So... This is not necessarily an uh, end of Yuzu, technically, because, you know, the official channels are gone, but it's an open source project. So there's copies out there everywhere, and it's been around for years, so it's probably still out there. But what's interesting to me is that the reason why this is a scary thing is mostly because of the money attached to it. But the money attached to it only, is kind of like a special case for Yuzu. Because there apparently was a Patreon system where you could get access to stuff before you were supposed to. 
And in some cases, the emulator, that's not a big deal, but maybe even games is what Nintendo is claiming. And also that there was a subreddit called Yuzu Pirates that effectively made it a popular thing to use Yuzu for pirating. So if that's part of what, like if they were involved in that, then it would kind of make sense that money would be attached to it. But if you're making a open source emulator, they really can't stop you from making the emulator. So other things, as long as they're not doing anything that could be considered actual damages of money, then they should be fine. So there is another, uh, d- another emulator you can check out. It's actually a specifically a Switch emulator. It's, the, it's called the Re- Ryu Jinx, I think. That's how you say it. It's uh, still operational for now. That might change, but it doesn't seem like they're doing anything that's similar. It seems like they're just focused on the emulator, so that's pretty cool. Whereas there is actually reports of Yuzu having game support for things that just came out on day one. And it's not, if it's you're doing reverse engineering, having access to something on day one doesn't typically work unless you have early access that you weren't supposed to get in order to work on it. So I don't know. It it could be just a completely different, unique situation that resulted in this. But it also is because Nintendo is notorious for lo- suing people over all sorts of stuff related to their pro- their IP stuff. So uh, you got to be very careful. So re- Ryu Jinx, uh, just a quick note. Please, please don't do that sort of stuff. <laughs> so you can k- keep existing. Yeah. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about this topic, links in the show notes. Funding for many open source collectives just hit a snag. The Open Collective Foundation, a popular fiscal host for these groups, is shutting down by the end of 2024. For those who don't know, a fiscal host means it's an entity that helps with legal matters for an open source project or collective of some kind. So, But just to do alleviate some concerns, while the name is eerily similar to opencollective.com platform, they are entirely different entities. For those affected by this, I do have some alternatives to tell you about, so let's break that down. But first, if you're doing something on opencollective.com, this has nothing to do with that. There's multiple different entities that have very similar names, which makes this kind of confusing. That's one of the reasons I wanted to cover this, because it is a bummer that this is happening, but also a lot of people are worried that this is affecting opencollective.com, and it is not. So let's talk about the alternatives for people who are part of projects that are affected by this. So this is a very surprise a closure because this fiscal host for the for the open source uh, projects is dissolving with basically out of nowhere and it's happening very quickly and they have 600 collectives that are impacted that they have been working with so a lot of them are scrambling to find some new homes and the, the donations for OCF are going to stop in March March 15th and they're going to suspend spending by September so this is a very quick thing that you if you are part of one of these projects you will need to move and where would you move? Well, there's a lot of alternatives, including the Software Freedom Conservancy, Num Focus for science projects, OS Geo for geo projects, uh, Hack Club for teens, and many more. Like, there's a lot of stuff. For example, there's the Open Collective, the Open Collective company that's open source collective that is also the Open Collective Europe. So, if you, there's a lot of stuff. So, <laughs> let's break that part down. So the existing funds will likely have to require a transfer to another public charity, and there's quite a few of those. Uh, for example, there's the Open Source Collective, which is a, a 501c6, and this is a U.S.-based fiscal host for open source projects. And then there's also the European version, which is the Open Collective Europe, which serves the European-based collectives, which obviously that makes sense. And there's also the Open Collective Inc., which is a separate for-profit company that offers basically a fiscal platform they met, that they're the ones who run the opencollective.org's uh, plat or not dot, opencollective.com platform. And uh, so, yeah, it's a confusing situation. Open Collective Foundation has nothing to do with opencollective.com. However, they use opencollective.com for part of their stuff. And also there's Open Source Collective and then the Open Collective Inc. and the Open Collective Europe. And uh, they're separate entities, although the Open Source Collective and the Open Collective Inc. are tied together because they were founded by the same person. So there is that. Whew, that was a lot. Okay, so if you are affected by the OCF shutdown, then 
uh, go check out the links in the show notes because there are a lot of alternatives. And also there's a really good uh, management tool that opencollective.com is doing to help these people find new places to put their project. And if you'd like to learn more in general, you'll find links in the show notes. Let's talk about endpoint security. When you go through the airport, for example, there's a security line to check your ID and then another line to scan your bags. And the same thing happens in enterprise security, but instead of passengers and luggage, it's end users and their devices. And these days, most companies are pretty good at the first part of that equation where they check the user identity. But user devices can roll right through authentication without getting inspected at all in some cases. In fact, 47% of companies allow unmanaged, untrusted devices to access their data. That means an employee can log in from a laptop that has a firewall turned off and hasn't been updated in six months. Or worse, that laptop could belong to a bad actor using employee credentials. Collide solves this problem, this device trust problem. Collide ensures that no device can log into your Okta-protected apps unless it passes your security checks. Plus, you can use Collide on your devices without MDM, like your Linux fleet, contractor devices, and every BYOD or bring-your-own-device phone and laptop in your company. So visit thisweekinlinux.com slash collide to watch a demo and see how it works. That's thisweekinlinux.com slash K-O-L-I-D-E. To all my fellow Fedora fans, we've got some big news. The Fedora project is considering ditching Xorg and going all in on Wayland for Fedora Workstation with Fedora 41, which is right around the corner later this year. There's one that's coming, Fedora 40 is coming actually around the corner, but there's another one later this year that's 41. While some users might be thinking this is X-Stream, the project is confident that Wayland will be ready for its close-up by Fedora 41. So let's talk about this and find out if you should put your worries a Wayland. Fedora dropping Xorg fallback for GNOME is something that is kind of worrisome for some people. But Wayland will be the only option as planned. It's technically being considered, but it's also very likely because the, there's a lot of agreement to doing it. So it's probably going to happen, but it's not officially confirmed, guaranteed. But it's probably going to happen. So Wayland will be the only option starting with Fedora 41, probably, which is expected in November, around November 2024. And this change follows the KDE decision because a similar move happened with a Fedora spin for KDE and with Fedora 40. It's already happened. And it's not technically out yet, but the next version that comes out, uh, April slash May, will have no uh, X11 support uh, with the KDE version or the KDE Plasma version. And I am actually running that right now. And I didn't notice that until I went to switch to confirm this information about this topic, I went to uh, try to go into the X and I noticed I couldn't do that. It wasn't even an option to switch at all. So yeah, that was um, interesting. Also, it didn't really affect me so far using it. I haven't really noticed any actual issues. So, and I'm using Fedora 40 nightly so I can play with the KDE Plasma 6 implementation that's not even out yet. They don't even have a beta yet. I just want, I just couldn't wait. So <laughs> I'm using that. But on the bright side, it also let me test this. Anyway, the reason why they're doing it is to focus on the future. This allows developers to prioritize Wayland improvements. There are possible hurdles that could happen. So like the screen reader compatibility for with Wayland might require some attention and that sort of thing. But there is a lot of interest in the idea of doing this because uh, I talked to a few developers who were envious of the idea of only working on a Wayland based system because then they don't have to do double work for having support of Xorg and stuff like that. So it's it's interesting that they might do it. And also it's not really surprising that Fedora would do it first because Fedora tends to do everything first. So I'm personally kind of torn by this news. Uh, there's going to be streamlining development, which could lead to uh, faster bug fixes for everyone, regardless of your platform, your in Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, whatever, which is, that's fantastic. But I'm also kind of torn on the fact that having that fallback just makes me feel more comfortable with it. And, you know, that might not be necessary at this point, and it might not be necessary for Fedora 41, and we'll have to wait and see for that one. But I think that there's a lot of potential for this to be a good thing and maybe a bad thing, but we'll have to wait and see. 
I, I think Waylon has made a lot of good strides over the past couple of years. So it is more likely to be a good time to do it. And it's also, like I said, not surprising for Fedora to do it because they have been known to do the innovative stuff and they're the ones that do the testing of stuff. And it's not necessarily testing. I mean, they're not just throwing stuff out there just in case. They're trying things that other ones are other distros are afraid to do sometimes. Like, for example, they're the first ones to implement system D, the first ones to implement p- uh, Pipewire, the first ones to implement a bunch of stuff. Even GNOME on Wayland by default, Fedora was the first to do that. Uh, all sorts of stuff. And this is just another one of those examples. So if Fedora is willing to do it, it typically means that it's probably fine to do it. And they're not just going to jump into it and just do some crazy experimental thing. They do a lot of testing beforehand. So I'm both torn by the idea of, I just like to have that fallback just in case, like just in case, but also I understand why they would want to do it because it eliminates a lot of duplicate effort and redundant work. So I get it. Still torn. (laughs) Let me know what you think in the comments below. And if you'd like to learn more, you'll find links in the show notes. Speaking of Fedora, for all the Fedora contributors out there, the Flock to Fedora conference is back. And this year, it's flocking to Rochester, New York for a celebration of community, code, and collaboration. This year's conference boasts a longer schedule, a focus on specific Fedora goals, and a chance to reconnect or connect for the first time with fellow Fedora enthusiasts. So gear up for your presentations, workshops, and maybe even some Rochester-style surprises. So what's happening, This, if for those who are not familiar, the F- Flock to Fedora is an annual Fedora contributor conference. All, I mean, it's annual typically. It hasn't been since, you know, the, the dark days of 2020. But it is back now, and that's awesome. So Flock to Fedora is happening in Rochester, New York at the Hyatt Regency. It's happening August 7th through the 10th, which is Wednesday to Saturday. And this is actually a change that's you typically the Flock to Fedora is three days. They've added a fourth day to this particular one. So that's going to be cool. There's going to be a lot of focus areas like accessibilities, global reach, community, innovation, specializations, partnerships, and all sorts of stuff like that. And if you would like to submit a, a talk, you can do their call for proposals is happening right now. So it's uh, uh, it's not OK. Technically, I'm not sure if it's actually happened yet, but it will be happening very, very soon if it hasn't. I forgot to check to see if the link was there, but there you go. Also, registration is coming soon for those who want to go to it. And there's even going to be a discounted hotel block available, which is always fantastic. And there's also uh, an ask for sponsorships. They have multiple levels of sponsorship for those who would like to do that. And uh, for those who are curious, it was scheduled to go to Mexico cities, but because the cost became too high and uh, Rochester availability opens and it just made more sense to transition to there. For those who are already planning to go and knew about the Mexico City thing, that's why it's going to be happening in Rochester instead. Plus, there's also apparently a really strong connection with the Rochester Institute of Technology, or RIT, and that's also a nice bonus, you know? So also, for those who are curious about whether or not you should attend, if you are a Fedora contributor and you can get there, you definitely should attend. And if you are just an enthusiast of Fedora, it's also going to be good for those people as well. And if I have any chance of making it, I think I would love to go because as you know, I'm a Fedora user, as I mentioned just in the previous topic. And yeah, that sounds really awesome. (laughs) If you'd like to learn more about this conference, you'll find links in the show notes. Linux gamers with AMD graphics cards, brace yourselves. After years of work, AMD has been denied by the HDMI forum in its quest to enable full HDMI 2.1 features for us Linux users through open source drivers. This means we won't get 4K at 120 hertz or 5K at 240 hertz goodness through the HDMI port. Uh, At least that's not through the open source route. They may do that with some kind of proprietary thing. That's still up in the air because AMD seems to be pretty awesome about that sort of stuff. And they might try to fix it, even though the HDMI forum is being annoying. Who knows? But there's also DisplayPort, which is better anyway, in my opinion. But there's a lot more to this story. And if you're curious about the technical details and the back and forth between AMD and the HDMI forum, check out the next episode of Destination Linux video podcast that's coming out tomorrow. For those new to DL, it's a fantastic podcast that I host alongside my friends Jill and Ryan. We'll take you on a deeper dive in this whole HDMI saga there. So go to destinationlinux.net to subscribe, and I'll see you there. Also, if you'd like to learn more right now, you can check the links in the show notes. Zorn OS just upped its game for Windows refugees. 
Version 17.1 boasts some of uh, some smoother Windows app integrations, uh, smarter recommendations for Linux alternatives, and a revamped education edition. If you're thinking about ditching Windows but worry about your favorite apps, Zorn OS 17.1 might be the penguin friend you've been looking for. So what's new with the Windows app support? Well, they've boosted it by having the latest wine and bottle support for smoother experience with Windows apps. Also, these, there's a smarter app recommendations, which is really cool that they even have this because they basically give some suggestions for Linux alternatives to the various Windows applications you might be using. And they've also improved that. Uh, they'll also have a revamp for the education edition, which is updating the software. And also there's a reading strip extension for better focusing, as well as updated a look and feel for the whole thing. So the thumbnails for more file formats are there. When there's new window placement options and just a lot of under the hood improvements like a newer Linux kernel. Uh, graphics stack has better performance and all that sort of stuff. And for those who are already using Zorn OS 17, the upgrade is pretty easy. You just go from 17 to 7.1, and that's it. Uh, for those who are going from a previous version of Zorn OS, there might be a little bit more involved in that. You can check the links in the show notes for more details. And they also, by the way, for those who don't know, Zorn OS has a core free version and a, a pro version for those who want extra features. You don't need to do the pro version because the extra features are not necessary. But for those who would like the extra stuff, there is that option, which I'm okay with. I think that, that it's there's a lot of question about whether or not a distro should have a paid version and a free version. And I think it's actually okay that paid versions exist. And uh, let me know what you think about the latest version of Zorin OS and also what you think about the whole idea of the debate between paying for a distro and not paying for a distro. Let me know in the comments. If you'd like to learn more about the latest release of Zorin OS, you'll find links in the show notes. For all the homebrew data hoarders out there, Open Media Vault 7.0 just launched, bringing a bunch of improvements for this open source NAS solution. This update streamlines software updates, adds a handy dandy disk temperature dashboard, and even lets you choose your favorite flavor of SSH key encryption. So time to dust off the spare Raspberry Pi and build yourself a super powered media server with Open Media Vault 7.0. Now this is a big upgrade because they have a whole new version of what de version of Debian they're based on. They're based on Debian 12 now, which improves a lot of things on the core, uh, improving the security and the features and all sorts of stuff. Because, you know, this is, Debian is not known for updating that much and that fast. But when you have a system that is a, a appliance kind of thing, that's not necessarily something that you really care about all that much. You want it to just work and do the thing it's supposed to do. So yes, Debian 12 came out a little while ago and they're just now adding it. But that's kind of fine, considering the fact that the purpose of this NAS is to basically be there to protect your data and have backups and stuff. And you wouldn't really want the latest and greatest upgrades as fast as possible and that sort of thing. At least I wouldn't. I don't know if you would. Let me know in the comments. But one thing they added, which is really cool, is now they've made the unattended uh, upgrades, which is basically automatic updates. So the new system ensures security patches are going to be installed automatically, which is really cool. Also, they have a revamp for the software RAID, now managed by a separate Open Media Vault plugin for more flexibility. Also, there's now hardware monitoring. The new dashboard widget displays all the physical disk temperatures. And they've also made it easier to do management of your SSH keys. You can choose between RSA or ED25519 key types during your creation and so much more. And if you're an existing user, you can upgrade using the OMV-upgrade tool. So you don't have to get a whole new fresh install. You can find more information about the latest release of Open Media Vault 7.0 in the show notes. Arch Linux users rejoice because there's a brand new version of Pac-Man, the package manager that every Arch Linux user loves to talk about being the best, no matter what, even if the syntax is super, super weird. After two year wait, Pac-Man 6.1 is finally here. This update brings a bounty of improvements, syntax is still weird, including faster downloads with cache servers and better error man messages. When your Penguin Pals encourage package problems, you can get ready for a smoother Arch experience thanks to the latest version of Pac-Man 6.1. So the cache servers is really cool because this is important due to faster downloads. You can download packages from local servers for even quicker installs, uh, which is perfect for large deployments. 
Also, uh, better error handling. Pac-Man throws more informative message when encountering issues, making troubleshooting easier. Also, improved security, better support for secure connections and checksum verification. And they've also improved package building. So, Make Package or Make PKG, the tool for building packages, gains new features for developers. And also, for those who are curious, uh, KDE Plasma 6 just came out recently and is now available for Arch Linux users. So, if you've been waiting for that news, there you go. And if you are an Arch Linux user, let me know what you think about the latest version of Pac-Man 6.1. I don't currently use Arch. It's I used to. It's been a while. But I, I still think that the syntax needs some work. <laughs> Let me know in the comments what you think. And if you'd like to learn more about the latest release of Pac-Man, you'll find links in the show notes. Have you ever dreamed of building your own operating system brick by brick? Or rather, command line by seemingly endless command line? Well, the latest update to Linux from scratch is here, featuring fr fresh packages, improved re readability, and even support for Vulkan graphics. For those unfamiliar, LFS, or Linux from Scratch, is a project that provides steps to build your own custom Linux system. This project is very cool, and anyone who goes through it will learn a lot. A lot. You will learn, a, and you will be forced to learn a lot, because it is not an easy thing to do. So, it's not for the faint of heart. Linux from Scratch is much different from the average distribution, because it's not really even a distro. It's more of a guide. In fact, it's basically a book for Linux build Linux system building from scratch, of course. So here's a quick comparison between distros. If you're not familiar with this, I'm going to give you a car analogy. So for comparison, people say that Arch Linux and Gentoo are hard to install. And that is certainly true when you attempt it for the first time. But Linux from scratch takes that whole idea and just cranks it up to 500 because most distributions are kind of like regular cars. If you get Ubuntu and that sort of thing, it's, it's like regular cars. And Arch Linux is kind of like a kit car where you still have to put it together, but everything is kind of like pre-made for you and you just had to put the configurations and that sort of stuff. And then Gentoo and Slackware uh, basically is kind of like you have to find the parts individually and then build the car from there. And Linux from scratch is kind of like Gentoo and Slackware, but instead of finding the parts, you have to manufacture the parts first, and then you can build the car. <laughs> That's basically how LFS works. It is very complicated, very cool. You will learn a lot, but it is not for the faint of heart. So let's talk about the latest version of LFS 12.1. The highlights are updated core packages, Benutils, glibc, that sort of thing for better performance. 43 total package updates for smoother experience, improved readability in the LFS book itself. Like I, I said, it's a book, not a distro. It's a book. Also, Linux kernel uh, bumped to version 6.7.4. Also, there's Beyond Linux from Scratch, which does even more and it has extra features and stuff like that. So there's Linux from Scratch and Beyond Linux from Scratch, so LFS and BLFS. There's also other stuff like Automotive Linux from Scratch, uh, or maybe it's Automated. I don't remember. <laughs> There's a, there's a few of these. Uh, there's the BLFS 12.1s add support for cutting edge graphics technologies like Vulkan and SPIRV or SPIRV. I'm not sure if you say it that way, but SPIRV. There's also new tools like Qt 6 support, uh, Sysmon Qt, power management features, and other things. And uh, a heads up, by the way, for BLFS, it's dropping support for outdated GTK2 and Python 2 in, the, in future releases. So you need to transition if for some reason you're still using GTK2 for, I don't know why you would, but or Python 2, I don't know why you would. Well, I guess GIMP does need GTK2 still, but that's going to change pretty soon because the next version of GIMP is going to have GTK3. But we're on GTK4 now, so yeah. If you'd like to learn more, about uh, Beyond Linux from Scratch or Linux from Scratch itself, you'll find links in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show and want to be kept up to date with what's going on in the Linux world, then be sure to subscribe and of course, remember to like that smash button. If you'd like to support the show and the Tux Digital Network, then consider becoming a patron by going to tuxdigital.com slash membership, where you can get a bunch of cool perks like access to our patron-only section of our Discord server at tuxdigital.com slash Discord and much, much more. You can also support the show by ordering Linux as our t-shirt or the This Week in Linux shirt that I'm wearing right now at tuxdigital.com slash store. 
Plus, while you're there, check out all the other cool stuff we have, like hats, mugs, hoodies, stickers, and so much more at tuxdigital.com slash store. We also have some new merch coming and some old merch that's going away. So within the next few days, if you want to get something that might be going away, I haven't decided exactly which which things are going away, but if you want to get something from the current store, then you have a couple days or so, and then we'll be getting a whole brand new store, not just new stuff, but a whole new store because, well, I'm not really a big fan of the current store. Long story. Long story. <laughs> anyway, I'll see you next time for another episode of Your Source for Linux Good News. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell. I hope you're doing swell. Be sure to ring that notification bell. And until next time, I bid you farewell.